everyone and welcome back to another live stream with me, Gizela K. We are waiting for a press conference to start. Uh, thank you so much for the earlier sticker there. Sorry, I did thank you in chat there. I can't remember. It was Nikki, right? Uh, Sweet dreams. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Welcome to all my moderators. Thank you for everything you do. Welcome to all my patrons and members. Thanks all for coming to the stream. We are going to be streaming about the Bardstown Unsolved Murders right after this. This press conference could be huge. Who knows what they're going to say, okay? So we're waiting for that. It's supposed to start in one minute. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much for your wonderful and kind message. Really appreciate it and for being a member for six months. Okay, so I see that uh, CBS News is going to be streaming it. So let's just get it ready over here. Just wait one second. I'll make it bigger for you when we can. Okay, we're waiting. <laughs> and so... Uh, Basically, what they're saying is new details about the Gilgo Beach murders. If you don't know anything about this case, uh, please check out my playlist, okay? We've done a deep dive on this case and big timelines and everything. I wanted to do a little recap for you, but we've run out of time a little bit now. So it's all in the playlist, okay? You can check it all out there. Thank you so much. There we go, Diana77. Really, really appreciate it. New details about the Gilgo Beach murders are expected to be revealed Wednesday afternoon. John Ray, the attorney for the victims for Shannon Gilbert, if you remember correctly, is holding a press conference at 3.15 p.m. in Miller Place. Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison is expected to attend. And that has not happened before. Just checking here. Just checking. Um, they haven't actually had... Sorry, that's a different one. They haven't had uh, the police commissioner there before when... John Ray has had these press conferences. He's had many, right? Okay. Yes, Jay Baloo says, uh, News 12 Long Island has so much on this. Yes, and so do we over here, right? Lots of videos for you to watch. Um, so you can watch the press conference streaming live on CBS New York, which is going to be on here as well. And Ray's office says it has new information about suspect Rex Human in the killings of Shannon Gilbert and Karen Vergara. If you remember, they recently identified... Fire Island Jane Doe is Karen Vergata. Here we go. There's the police commissioner. Whoa. Can you hear guys? It's Good boosted. afternoon, everybody. We're here today because new information has been, uh, has arisen in this case from witnesses who were so far unknown. Those witnesses, of which there are four, have given us statements, two of whom have given us affidavits regarding this case, regarding Rex Uriman and Shannon Gilbert and Karen Vergara. Before I talk about them, first, I want you to be aware that here stands the commissioner, as you know, with me. And up until now, we have not made it known to the public that we have been working together on this case steadily since the time that I came to know Commissioner Harris a year ago, February. Uh, we, up until that point, the police department was very resistant to receiving any kind of evidence or information from my office from what I was doing. That all changed significantly when uh, Commissioner Harris stepped in and we uh, began to collaborate. And we've collaborated ever since. That collaboration has had fruit. And that fruit, at least, are the witnesses I'm going to be talking about today, as well as other evidence and information which we have shared together and with the police department, uh, and this, uh, therefore with the task force. So it is true to say that our cooperation has given rise to more substantial, valuable evidence in the entire case of the Long Island serial killer. So with that in mind, I'm very pleased that, that Commissioner Harrison has seen fit to open his mind and, and to do what I'm suggesting has been done, uh, contrary to all those who have come before him. 
and he's approaching this case in the right way. He's the right man for the job, and he's done his job well. As to the witnesses, as to the evidence, in no particular order of importance, because so much of it is important, I have stood as a beacon to, as a civilian beacon, to the people who are involved in this case to come and talk where they didn't want to approach the police out of fear, out of tra a apprehension, uh, out of a natural, some in some cases, a natural distaste for the police department because of the work these people were in. So they would then come to me and speak to me, and I would interview them, and we would then cooperate, I, them, and the police department. And so with that in mind, the first two witnesses I'm going to talk about are uh, both of them uh, are not Suffolk County residents. I should point out that uh, we obtained from these two affidavits, their names will go unmentioned, their, their names are blotted out of the affidavits, but the affidavits will be available to you right after the press conference. As to the first one I'll talk about, this is a witness who has every reason to have no bias, no interest in the case whatsoever. She was not a sex worker, is not a sex worker, and instead, back in the 90s, in the 1990s, she was what is known then and now as a swinger. She would have a sex partner and they would go to certain sex clubs in New York City where they would switch partners with other people of like kind. One of the most important places that they would go was called La Trapeze on West 27th Street in New York, right near uh, uh, Rex Uriman's office. And this was a notorious place for swapping, for switching partners. Uh, sometimes several hundred people at a time would be involved in this place in its heyday. Its heyday was in the late 90s, uh, right at the time that uh, Karen Vergata is involved in this case. In this situation, this particular woman was uh, dating a police officer from New York City who was in narcotics, a detective, and uh, they would go to these, these switchy clubs, these swapping clubs. At a certain time, at, at or about Valentine's Day of 1996, I believe, uh, the, the, uh, the couple went to Le Trapeze, and I think it was on the wall at Le Trapeze where an advertisement wa uh, was placed to go to a house in Massapequa Park for partying, for switching, for swapping. She went with her boyfriend uh, out to Long Island. But before they went, her boyfriend picked up a, a woman in New York, in the city, who had apparently just gotten out of jail. And she was disheveled and hungry. And she was a sex worker. We don't know the details yet of how he came to know her, but he knew her. And she came in the car with the two of them. They went to Massapequa Park. Before they got there, they stopped at a gas station, and the girl who was with them expressed some apprehension about where they were going and why. Uh, that was all wiped out when it was pointed out that he's a police detective, so don't worry, no problem. They ended up going to Rex Uriman's house. In the house was the wife of Rex Uriman, and uh, Rex Uriman and the, the, the other girl. The other girl, who we believe to be Karen Vergata. She, this girl, disappears downstairs at the house. Rex Uriman disappears. And according to our witness and other witnesses I've talked to, when men are swingers with their, their partner, very often they switch sexually, they go back and forth between male and female. And so Uriman leaves 
the main floor and disappears either into another bedroom or downstairs. It's not clear. And the witness talks to Rex's wife. She doesn't want to have sex like she had expected uh, to occur because our client believes because our client is an African-American woman. And Uriman didn't like that. Uh, Ellerup, rather, didn't like that. So there was no sex between them, as was originally planned. Instead, the sex is between Uriman and the other man. At some point, the witness goes looking for her partner and is kind of upset that he doesn't emerge. He emerges, and finally, they leave and kind of in a hurry. But when they leave, as they're leaving, the witness points out that she could see in the window, looking out, the girl the, that had come with them. And she says to her, her uh, driver, her, her partner, what are we doing? Are we taking her? And the partner says, don't worry. They're just playing a game. She stays there. No problem. With that, the girl runs out of the house naked and is running in front of the garage. And now the witness says, hey, shouldn't we be taking her? Something's wrong here. And the driver tells her, no, nah, they're just playing a game. Leave it. And they leave. She never hears about the incident again. She distinctly remembers Uriman. She also had intercourse with Uriman that, that same day. And uh, she kind of you know, buries it, forgets about it. Until on TV, she sees the picture of Karen Vergata. And she recognizes her and said, that's her. And she recognizes R Rex Uriman. And so she comes forward, forward, and I meet her. I interview her at great length. Uh, I also had the police department, uh, we, we arranged for detectives to interview her, and I found her story, I interviewed her for three times for a total of nine hours, and uh, I found her story to be credible. She also mentioned that Rex would go out in the backyard and start a fire at one, two o'clock in the morning in a big barrel that was outside in the back. And she was worried about that, too, that it would attract police. Anyway, she seemed credible. She appears to be credible. And she was willing to sign an affidavit to that effect. And that affidavit will be available to everybody. In, and in the details I've just told you, you will find there. The second witness who's come forward. This woman is not a sex worker, never was. She's not a switcher or swapper. She's not involved in any sexual activities whatsoever. She has nothing to gain by coming forward. She's not looking for a book or money or the usual things that you're hearing about out there. None of that. But she came forward because she's very disturbed about what she knows after she also saw uh, Rex Uriman on television and Shannon Gilbert. And here is her story. She's a, she is a uh, banker by day, and at night she worked extra in Suffolk County as a taxi driver to take care of her family you know, with a one-parent family. As a taxi driver, she is called from her dispatcher to go to the Sayville Motor Lodge on Sunrise Highway, that infamous place that the commissioner here busted a year ago and for, for uh, prostitution and other illegal activities. She's called to go to that place and that there's a girl awaiting her in, who's locked in a bathroom and will come out if she flashes her lights and beeps the horn. And she goes there and does that several times. It doesn't work. But then suddenly a giant man who fits the description of Rex Uriman comes out and he's covering his face with his arms so he can't be seen and he runs to a van 
uh, or a, an SUV right nearby that's parked right there. She continues to flash her lights and beep her horn, and out comes a girl crying, shaking, very upset, and gets in her car. There they talk for a while, and then eventually they drive to the Ronkonkoma, I believe, Ronkonkoma Railroad Station, so that this girl can go back in to New York City. This girl uh, was a sex worker who was servicing the big man, and uh, the man had seduced her into coming to Sayville by several times over the telephone, convincing her that he, would, he was just a nice man who was going to help and work uh, with her to help her family, her mother, her sisters, and her boyfriend. Shannon has a mother, sisters, and a boyfriend at that time. She had her hair pulled back and uh, because she often wore wigs. This girl turns out to be Shannon Gilbert. Now, Shannon is lured into doing this particular tryst, and she's given a, a, an envelope, or shown an envelope by the man that looked like it was stuffed full of money, and he tells her, there's a thousand dollars in there, it's for you and your family no matter what happens tonight. She looks in the envelope when he goes to the bathroom, and it's stuffed with paper. And so she panics and realizes something's wrong. So she goes in the bathroom, and he had become very aggressive, very angry. She goes in the bathroom, locks the door, and calls to get a cab. And that's how she comes out. They speak for over an hour. So the driver knows her well and notices that she has a drooping eye, uh, which is characteristic of Shannon, uh, and also a characteristic of her, her family, by the way, uh, going back f for a, a, a generation or two. And so she no notices that, and it helps her to remember Shannon when she sees her later on. That's the first part of the story. It doesn't end there. This is part two. Several days or weeks later, it's not clear, and this is all occurring in the fall of 19... I'm sorry, in the fall of uh, 2009. This is all occurring. Uh, she... The driver gets another call from the same dispatcher and says that there's a man named Matt who she's to pick up uh, right off of exit 59 in the expressway and uh, he, would be by, he would be at a bar that was there by I guess Ocean Avenue somewhere over there. She goes there, pulls up on a side street at, between the bar and a house right next to it and she sees a girl in a window and then she sees to the right of her a man, a huge man, rising up, coming to the car. He's dressed in camouflage, and he look, leans in and then jumps in the back seat, sits on the edge, and leans over and starts talking to her, and she's watching him very carefully in the mirror. And she recognizes him as the same guy that was at the motel a, a, a little while before. And she now knows him to be, she recognizes him from the... Uh, from the media as Rex Ehrman. He says to her that he wants her to take, her on a, uh, take him on a long trip into the woods. In other words, he changed the destination she had been told, which caused her immediately to become suspicious. And he was very upset, very angry, and he began to dispute with her when she said, I'm not going on a long trip anywhere. And uh, with that, he gets extremely angry and threatens to kill her and tells her, I already want to kill you, just give me a reason. And he had a gun, a handgun. She says, I'm not going anywhere at this point, and she turns off the car, and she says, you can have the keys, you can have my money, whatever you want, just let me go, I'll let you have whatever you want. With that, her dispatcher is on the, the radio, and he says out loud, we know, we see you, we hear you, we can tell who you are, and the man panics, gets out of the car. She's then able to drive away. She encounters a police car coming the other way. She believes that the police officer was called uh, by a 911 caller on that issue. Could have been the girl who was in the house right next door from where she was. But comes the police, 
driving slowly with his lights off. She tells him the story, and the man had on a lanyard with a placard of some kind, as if he were a police officer. And she asked him, are you a cop? And he said, yes. She said, from where? He said, Brooklyn. With those facts in mind, she tells the police officer who's driving, there's one of yours back there, and it looks like he's had a bad day. So you better go see what's what, words to that effect. She later on hears from her dispatcher that he, this man, uh, went into the woods and fired off his pistol twice. And she recognizes him very clearly to be Rex Uriman when she sees him. So she's given us this affidavit as well. There's a pattern that's developing here of Rex Uriman uh, being somebody who traces down, tracks down people and, and haunts them. Uh, and, and Shannon Gilbert would therefore be no exception. Now, the third witness has not given a statement yet. The third witness contacted me from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And that witness clearly recalls being picked up. She was a, a street walker. She gets picked up by Rex Uriman, he, uh, in, in Queens, and he drives, I think, near the, uh, the big center there in Queens, and he drives her into a park in Flushing, where he meet, makes her keep her head down at all times, commit oral sex, and then he has a pistol in his hand and tells her, get out of the car or I'm going to kill you. And don't do anything except what I tell you to do or I'm going to kill you. So she gets out of the car and he tells her, before he, she does, he tells her, I want you to pick up another person, another customer. She gets out of the car and immediately pulls up a, a, another SUV and a man driving it, an African-American man, and the, the guy that picks her up is white, and she gets in the other guy's car, and the driver, Rex Uriman, follows the car. They go. Finally, get out of the car because she panics and pulls the wheel because she sees a cop car coming. So the cop sees them go jaggedy off the road, and the cop stops them. The cop then goes back, talks to Rex and the other driver who gets out and walks back. The cop comes back and tells her, lady, if you want to make a complaint, you have to go to the precinct and drives away. That's her story. She also has no reason. She refuses to come forward. She refuses to have herself identified. I know her name. I know her address. I've given it to the police. They're aware of it, and presumably they're investigating it. Uh, you see the pattern. There's a pattern of a guy who likes to play kind of sporting games with, with the sex workers, chases them, haunts them, hunts them. That's what we're looking at here, we believe, anyway. Um, the fourth witness, and I'll finish on that, she comes from another state, and uh, she's contacted me as well. I have very lengthy notes and recordings of what we discussed. She was a sex worker for many years, uh, back in the time when all of these killings were occurring, and she serviced Rex Uriman. She said that she would service Rex Uriman over 20 times, and that he, would, he was a serial user of sex workers. He would sometimes have them come two at a time to his house, and his wife was home upstairs, and in one instance got very angry at one of the sex workers because the wife believed that the worker had stolen an iron from, you know, for ironing clothes and had uh, had it in the car with the driver. So the driver had to get out, everybody had to search the car, there was no iron. But, but the, the wife knew about it and knew about, obviously, what was going on in order for that to happen. So she says that in her experience with, with, with Uriman, he was never impolite, he was always nice, he was always funny, he, he treated her well, and there was no violence. But he certainly had contact with Rex constantly for a period of several years. That's as much as I'm able to tell you. There's plenty of other new evidence, which I think it will take too long at this press conference to discuss. There's plenty of new other evidence that's similar in kind and consistent in, with the kinds of things that I've just described to you. 
So with that thought, I'm hoping that the police department will continue <coughs> along with the, um, the task force, that they will continue to look into these things, investigate them thoroughly, make the synapses that haven't been made so far, connect them up and connect the dots as it were, and I think we're getting to where we want to go. Lastly, I am still working on this case. Today I took Joseph Brewer's deposition, the John for Shannon Gilbert. I just finished it and came here. I'm still actively pursuing this case on my own as well as cooperating with the police department and the task force. But for people out there who have information and are afraid to come forward to the police, they can talk to me, they can reveal whatever they want, I will reveal it to no one. I reveal these things with their permission, the things that I told you about. But anybody else that still has information, I'm available. My door is open. My phones are open. I can help you. Thank you. Okay, it's here. You know, I don't want to uh, make Rex Schumann the prime suspect. I, I will say this, and uh, I'll share this over and over again. Uh, the creation of the task force uh, got us into a good place of being able to identify Rex for uh, three of the uh, sex workers that were discovered, and we're looking very good uh, for the fourth one. Uh, but we also added two more investigators to the task force to take this type of information in and to pursue it, to follow it, to see if this is credible. Uh, that's very important, and that's why uh, people don't understand. When I first came into this position, uh, I sat down with John Ray, uh, myself and the members of the task force, to have that conversation about information that he may have, and, and let's make sure we're... Uh, putting a, a dragnet out there regarding any information that's coming to us. That's why I'm going to continue my partnership with John. And if people have a reluctancy to come forward to law enforcement and they want to go to John Ray, then it's important that we take this information and then we follow forward with uh, furthering the investigation. So I uh, it's still an ongoing investigation. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, once again, is this, we have the information, we're working it. And uh, we'll see where it leads us down the road. And you're saying to us earlier that you're going to leave no stone unturned, and the fact that there are possibly more affidavits that you can use to possibly find future victims. I, absolutely, and that's and that's a very good question, and uh, that's why I stand here today with John Ray. Uh, you know, if people uh, don't want to use our Crime Stoppers hotline, and they feel a lot more comfortable going to John Ray or, or anybody else. You know, I, I want to make sure that people understand uh, that we have a job here as law enforcement, as the Suffolk County Police Department, to make sure we investigate every single uh, complaint or interest in this case, uh, make sure that we look under every single stone to see if there is any connection to Rex Shurman or if there is a connection to somebody else that may be involved with the bodies that were discovered on Ocean Parkway. So we could go about uh, about a month and a half, uh, two depending months. on two months, depending on each one. Uh, for one of the affidavits, I was actually sat down with the the person myself. This just shows you my vested interest in it. Uh, you know, listen, this is something that's very important to me. Uh, I'm going to continue to grind to make sure anybody that had an interaction with our defendant Rex Sherman is held accountable in this case. The uh, the livery cab driver, the taxi driver? driver. Yeah. That's the one with Shannon Gilbert. That's the one with Shannon Gilbert. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, what year was that? Two thousand seven or nine? Two thousand nine. The taxi driver is two thousand nine. The fall of two thousand nine, and she is not absolutely certain of the time frame, but that's where it approximates. And that's where, Mary, that's where we're going to make sure we're doing our job and trying to nail down time frames, look at uh, uh, radio runs and other things that can help us kind of pinpoint uh, if there is any credibility to these complaints that, come forward, that came forward. And the commissioner did send 
two detectives to interview the other witness with me, uh, which, which we did already and, and uh, at length. Yes. Yeah, it was certainly a, a, a question we had to ask. Uh, you know, we have to ask many, many questions to test credibility. And, and I'm not saying that people would necessarily lie, although they might, but that they don't remember or they mix up facts with other, other situations. We had to test all of those things. And so we had to test that, too. And uh, in the one case with the, uh, the witness with the swapping, she, she just, she, it bothered her that they left behind this girl, but she had no other reason to think anything of it until she saw this. She actually broke down. She couldn't believe it when she saw the picture and knew that girl. Uh, and that, that happened there. With the uh, taxi driver, the taxi driver did report it. The taxi driver, uh, back in when this originally happened, she, she talked to her, uh, she, her cousin was a cop. She spoke to her family. She spoke to other taxi drivers. She told a lot of people about it. And then she did contact Crime Stoppers and, and report it and actually talked to them twice, but nobody called her back. So that's before, long before the commissioner was involved. So she did come forward and she said, well, you know, <laughs> she, when, when it got uh, reactivated, the issue, then she called me. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, the way John explained it, and you got to just kind of take this into context, uh, she doesn't have a, a stake in the game. She's a um, cab driver at night, uh, had a profession during the day. You know, she's not necessarily from this neighborhood. So, you know, this little things like that kind of piqued my interest. And uh, once again, is this, you know, why did she come forward and uh, her role and story and everything? It's, it's something that we need to take a closer look at and we need to make sure we're investigating it. And that's why the task force will stay in place. Uh, that's why we, we added more manpower to it. Uh, we're going to continue to work with our law enforcement partners and uh, see if there is any nexus to, um, uh, to our defendant, Rex Shearman. Or once again, like I said before, if there happens to be another subject out there, we'll we'll look at them as well and see if we can hold them accountable. And it was reported that uh, you guys were honing in on Valerie Mack and Karen Vergata in this case. Does this add Shannon Gilbert to the list of those two women that you're intensely looking at? You know their personal lives and whereabouts. Well, it's, it's all the uh, bodies that were discovered. Let's not rule out Peaches, the Tyler, the the Asian male. I, you know those were the names uh, that I shared with Tony, but it doesn't mean that. Uh, we're not continuing to look at all the bodies that were discovered there, but uh, the ones right now that uh, J John has when it comes to uh, Ms. Vergata and when it comes to Ms. Gilbert are the ones that we're going to take a closer look at and see if they're connected to our defendant. Any update on the uh, fourth uh, victim, uh, Megan? Yeah, so I, I know our district attorney should be doing an announcement uh, real soon, and uh, he'll keep you advised regarding if there's a, a nexus uh, to the uh, to the DNA that was recovered, and if there, if there is a match. So this witness one said that Rex had sex with both the woman who you think that was Regatta and this other man, a North Korean detective. So knowing that indicates he's probably potentially bisexual. Does that make him more of a leading suspect in the Asian male? Listen, any, anything is possible, uh, but once again, is this? This is something that we need to investigate, and I'm sure everybody can understand uh, there's a judicial process still going on. There's uh, ongoing investigation now that this information has been provided to us. I can only share but so much, uh, but I will uh, reassure everybody here, we are not done with this investigation. I want to make sure that that's very clear. Well, I can't say he is, and I can't say he's not. I, he certainly reactivated interest in himself by what he did up on Bald Hill, uh, which, by the way, you should probably you probably know that it's a notorious place for men picking up other men. I've represented several clients from that hill for that very same thing, and Burke was a street smart cop. 
He's even noted in his disciplinary record for being extremely streetwise. He would have known what goes on up on that hill, but he also would have known the risk he was taking, and he took it anyway. Burke, the risk taker, emerges, first of all, and second of all, Burke who is interested in men emerges, which is very much consistent with what I had said for years, that he was cross-dressing when he was with some of my clients, inc including uh, 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 Loretta Rickenbacker, uh, and that he had that other interest. Do, the, do those other interests matter? Sure they do. If you're going to look at the old police department and see w why did Burke get to where he went so easily, could it be that there's more sexual in, improprieties on higher levels than we originally thought? It's something that should be looked into. We don't know. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. No. Did she only contact you after seeing Rex Ehrman and Shannon Gilbert's face on TV? Yes, she contacted me after she saw uh, Rex Ehrman on TV and Shannon Gilbert. And then she contacted me, and then I went to see her, and w she's from not from this state. She, okay, so she claimed that she never saw Shannon Gilbert's face on, on TV or on the media prior to this year. That I don't know. I can't say she claimed that. I, I don't. I honestly don't remember what, whether I asked her that or not. All right, sorry. Thank you, everybody. All right, thanks, everybody. We give you the uh, the affidavits. Okay. Wow. Guys, <laughs> that was a lot. That was so much that you can definitely expect bullet points from me in the next day or two. <laughs> I'm going to be watching that all again and not on fast speed at all. Slow, very slow speed and like what? That was a lot. Okay, that was, uh, if you didn't know, the attorney for Shannon Gilbert's family. Okay, maybe let me bring up a little bit of a timeline here for you guys. I'm going to go over some of the notes that I wrote, but please don't worry. Okay, if you feel lost and confused, okay, you won't be lost and confused. Maybe we can go over that tomorrow or the next day. We shall see. Okay, now... Let's first look at something here. Hold on one second. Is it this one? Yes. Okay. So this is one of the presentations. We've done many presentations on this case. So Rex Hurman is the suspect arrested in the Gilgo four murders. He's been charged with three out of the four murders. Now, out of all the other bodies they found, remember how they discovered the bodies. They were busy looking for Shannon Gilbert. She was the first person to go missing. And this attorney you just saw at the press conference is Shannon Gilbert's family attorney. Okay, unfortunately, Shannon's mom was actually murdered by one of her daughters. That was so hectic. This case is like, oh my word, so much. Okay, but um, John Ray has never, ever stopped fighting for Shannon. He has never accepted that she just ran out into the marsh and that's that. Okay, she died, you know, by mistake and that's it. He's always said there's too many red flags there. It needs to be reinvestigated. They did a private autopsy. He said that um, he believes she was strangled and things like that. And now he's bringing forth some more information, right? Okay. Angel Rock says, I was just thinking. So I do think we all need to watch it on replay. And then please come back. Um, whether I think it, it could be tomorrow. We've just we've still got the Bardstown stream to do. And now I might actually shift that to tomorrow or the next day. Maybe we'll, I don't know, we'll figure it out, okay? But just make sure you subscribe, hit the bell, make sure you get all the notifications <laughs> because there's a lot to unpack here. But basically, let me just, I'm just going to go forward here. So the Gilgo Beach murders, okay? You can see we've even flown the route and everything. Rex Ehrman has been charged with three out of the four murders, as you can see as I circled there. But there's still many that are unsolved cases where investigators are working on that, okay? So just for those that were asking in chat, this is why I like my presentations. They come in handy. <laughs> um, you know, wasn't it, wasn't he with his first wife? No, he was with his second wife, Asa Ellerup, already, okay? Wayne says, wow, talk about Pandora's box being open. <laughs> I know, right? So Rex Ehrman, we've looked at this, born in 1964. So then in 1990 to 1993, he was married to his first wife. And they got divorced, and the accusation was, you know, his infidelity, that 
He'd been cheating a lot and possibly with sex workers. So she was like, bye, right? Then he got married. In 1994, he, he bought his childhood home, which is where, that's what they dug up, okay? And then started his own company. And in 1996, around there, um, he was already married to Asa, and they had a daughter, Victoria, and he also had a stepson with Asa Elera. So there's that. And they've lived in that home ever since, right? Okay. So the crimes that they were looking at were between 1997 and 2010. Now, there's been a lot of corruption. It just is. It's not, there's not speculation. There was a lot of corruption in the investigation initially, which is why there was a new task force formed in 2020, in 2020, 2022, 2020 or 2022. 2022 recently new task force and they re-looked at it and they within a month or so they already had the eyes on rex Hurman, um and they did a great job of actually apprehending him all right so let me just go forward i just want to show you um just this little timeline because it might help so there's the house that we're talking about and this is the house that john ray is referring to where he talked about this first witness okay so i'm just going to do a brief uh, breakdown he talked about this witness and he was saying something about, um, don't worry, we're going to do a much better job later with bullet points. A la, a la trapeze, notorious swingers spot in Manhattan, very close to where Rex Hurman worked. He worked as an architect in Manhattan, New York. Okay, so there was apparently on the wall an advert to go and party at a house in Massapequa Park and John Ray's alluding to it being this house. Okay, so we've got that. And so that's where that story begins. So now we do have to ask ourselves, <laughs> the best way to simplify things, okay, is to ask, what's the motive? Why would the police commissioner stand next to attorney John Ray, who said a lot of crazy things along the way, okay, that might be starting to fall into place, but why would he stand there next to him if the information wasn't credible? Well, the thing is that sex workers have been reluctant to talk to the police for so long. Of course, they're scared that they'll be maybe arrested for something or they're scared that they won't believe them or they just discount their stories, which is how they were treated initially. Now, the thing is having John Ray there, okay, to work with them. It's so smart that they're partnering with him instead of being like, just, you know, no, no, we don't want to hear your story. They're listening to what John Ray has to say. This is an excellent new task force that's been on the case ever since they joined they've really done a good job including with the uh, district attorney Ray Tierney so the thing is why would they do that well they're partnering with John Ray because he would be you know like the, the gateway to talk to even if the um, witnesses and people like that are not comfortable talking to police they can talk to John Ray and he can pass on the information so maybe they feel a lot safer. He's like an informant, if you know what I mean, which is, I think it's a really smart strategy. And I think it can help the case go forward a lot. As we looked at in previous streams, uh, investigators were actually starting to interview sex workers that were in jail or in prison. And, you know, asking them, have you encountered Rex Hurman and what, what did you think? And of course, they're building their case. The prosecution is building the massive case against him, while, of course, investigators are still investigating forensic evidence. Yes. So I just wanted to go over this quick little timeline like this, just so that you can just see it again, which might just help a little bit with some that we know here. I'm just showing you Shannon Gilbert. Um, I put some dates here of when they were last seen, last seen running in the Oak Beach complex. So it was May 1st, 20, May 1st, 2010. I just want to make sure of that. I just got to check this Shannon Gilbert. She was the first person to go missing, right? Okay, she was 23 when she vanished. Her remains were found in December of 2011. Yes. Okay. So we had a look at this overview of these uh, victims. Maureen Brainard Barnes, he hasn't been charged with her murder yet, but he is the prime suspect in her murder. So, so far, Rex Hurman is facing murder charges for Amber Costello, uh, Megan Waterman, and Melissa Bartholomew. So attorney John Ray is adamant that Shannon Gilbert is somehow connected to Rex Hurman, which it could be with this nexus and that nexus could be former police officers or police officers engaging in sex work or, you know, some of them like James Burke had been fired. It could be all of that, but maybe she encountered Rex Hurman 
How do we know he wasn't at that house partying that night as well? All that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> Ms. Zippy says, um, you say, hectic on my word. Yes, thank you for being a member for 10 months. Okay, I just want to see if I've got it like this. The Gilgo 4 discovery, as you can see, when they went missing and when they were discovered. Just check out the playlist. It's going to make a lot more sense for you if you want a deep dive on the timeline. I'm just showing you a quick overview just so that you can kind of gauge what are we talking about. <laughs> and so recently they actually identified Fire Island Jane Doe who is now Karen Vergara. And that is who, uh, so not Valerie Mack, they're talking about Fire Island Jane Doe. Let's go here. So Peaches, a baby, and the Asian male are still unidentified. But this Fire Island Jane Doe is Karen Vergara, and this ties into the story that John Ray was telling about Witness 1. He believes, based on what the witness said, it was Karen Vergara at the house that night, Rex Yeoman's house. And that would mean then that Rex Yeoman's wife obviously knew about these activities, but I would still argue that she may not have known about the murders. You know what I mean? She might have been engaging in... We don't know. These are just stories for now, okay? But she might have been engaging in the, the swinging and the sex activities, but not known, you know, what happened. Maybe he said, oh, no, she left or whatever if he did kill these victims, right? Okay, the real queen T says, I knew when the wife's hair was found on a victim, she was involved. Okay, I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm still very, very cautious to say things like that. And I mean, the police have said that they they do not believe that she was involved. So we are yet to see. Okay, I don't gun for family members. Um, I'd rather be like, oh, so shocked. Like, you know, a year down the line or whatever. Um, what I am concerned about is, of course, she's, she wants all the guns back that the police have taken because she wants to sell it because she thinks it's worth about $300,000 and that is how she's going to survive. So I can see a lot of you in chat were saying, don't give her the guns back and all of that, right? There we go. Number seven was Fire Island Jane Doe. And that would be, um, I'm just showing you on the map here quickly. That would be Val, um, Karen Vergara. And if you look at all the bodies then, and if she was seen at Rex Human's house, we don't know if she, what date that was, if she was murdered that night. We don't know. You know, even if Rex had some of these other sex workers at his house, we don't know if he's responsible for their murders. So we've got to keep an open mind. Anyway, so there's all of that. But basically, John Ray today spoke at this press conference about four witnesses. He said an affidavit will be available afterwards to everyone with all these details in. Okay. And so... I'm going to make sure that I bullet point all those details for you so that it makes so much more sense. And I'll bring you more maps and more of these um, detailed outlines so that we really get the story that Ray, John Ray was telling. So there was witness one, two, three, and four. We're going to get an affidavit with all the information. Um, the district attorney is apparently going to be making some statements soon or an announcement soon because they've been doing a lot of forensic tests and maybe he's got some stuff to say as well. Um, Rodney Harrison, the police, Suffolk County Police uh, Commissioner, said this is basically a dragnet. It's a partnership with John Ray and we have a job to do. So that's what it is. Let's get as much information in as possible. And if John Ray is our man, where these people are going to go to him and talk to him rather than us, let that be so. Right? <laughs> okay, but that really was a lot of information that we learned there. Um, so they said they're also looking into anyone who had an interaction with Rex Uriman. John Ray was describing throughout the four witnesses accounts a basically a profile of Rex Uriman that he likes the the sport and we we know that we've heard this all along the way there were people that worked with Rex in his building that said sometimes if he saw a client walking towards them he'd say uh, target acquired you know so you would talk about women as targets and, you know, hunt women and all that kind of stuff. So he did like hunting as well. And initially we thought, well, is it just like, you know, what, what kind of hunting? But he used to go to Alaska to hunt bears, apparently. So there was that and he bragged about it and everything and made all the women at the office very uncomfortable as well. Uh, Carla says, maybe us is receiving threats. I thought I heard, yeah, she actually said guns and jewelry. And I don't know if they can give that back because some of the jewelry could be some of the trophies that he collected. If so, if of course he's an, he's a, an, an alleged serial killer, right? She said, you said, I hope she and the kids are well. Isn't one special needs? Yes. So steps, her son, I think it's her son and Rex's stepson is special needs. <laughs> you say yay for two months with the Grizzlies. Okay. 
They've also added two detectives to the task force. They say the task force stays in place. They're looking into this nexus that could involve Rex Hurman. And then, of course, John Ray went into James Burke being a high risk taker. Now, if you don't remember that, we recently went over that as well. Don't worry. We're going to, we're going to, everything he said today, we're going to bullet point and expand on. Okay. So not right now. I want to do a really good job at presenting it all to you, as you know. So I've got lots of work to do, basically, until I see you again. Okay, so that's what we have there. Also, a very important point is that uh, someone said earlier, wait one second, Regina, you said him being with a male previously ties the Asian male victim him in. It could, it could. Remember what he was actually, I wonder if I have it on that screenshot. We looked at the entire um probable cause affidavit and all the things that he was um, googling and some of them were it was very disturbing stuff that he was uh, googling of course the google search got him we saw some of those if you missed that episode there's a video about it where we read through everything of exactly how did they how did they find rex Hurman after all this time why him how did they and all of that right so go and check that out if you haven't ever seen that but basically there he was um looking up an Asian male and stuff like that, right? But now, according to this witness one, with Rex having sex with another male, then it would mean that he is speculatively, not that we need to know about his sexuality, but speculatively for the sake of perhaps the Asian male victim who has not yet been identified, he could be responsible for that. Because that was always the anomaly of like, wait a minute. So there's Peaches, uh, Jane Doe, and a toddler. But then there's also this unidentified Asian male. How does that work? And the Asian male was dressed in women's clothing. However, with what we're hearing about Rex from these witnesses, which I would still say take with a, just a bit of salt, um, you know, um, it, sound, it sounds plausible, right? It sounds plausible. Okay. So, basically, I hope, I hope what I'm saying today makes sense, okay? They said... Um, you know, do you think these witnesses are credible? And of course, the police commissioner says there's still an active and ongoing investigation. It's still an open investigation. We'll have to see. But basically, what they're trying to do is make sure that they have an appeal to the public to come forward with information to all who encountered Rex Hurman and for sex workers to not be afraid to talk to either the police or to John Ray. And the reason this is also necessary is because of how botched the case was before. There were very corrupt police officers working there before, and I think a corrupt uh, district attorney as well ended up, the, the James Burke went to prison and all of that, and then he came out, and then he was recently arrested again, all of that, right? It really messed up the case. And sex workers did not feel safe to talk to the police at all. So this is an appeal to say, hey, we are dedicated to solving this case to continue with this investigation, please come forward with any information, right? So that's what we have. That was a lot. <laughs> um, my, my mind is pretty blown from everything we heard today because I'm like, whoa, that, like, it, there's so much there. So I'm going to summarize it for you. Now, the thing is, I was going to do a stream right after this. But I'm thinking, based on everything we just heard, I really want to make sure that we pay really good attention to what I prepared for you with the Bardstown Unsolved Murders. And so instead of going from this one to that one, I think I'm going to um, postpone that one, okay? So just hold on one second. I'm going to postpone that one possibly to tomorrow or the next day. I'll check that out right after the stream and make a decision there. The reason being that I want to bring you this, this summary. So maybe we can do Bardstown tomorrow and then the summary on Friday or the other way around, okay? So we'll do that. Don't worry. You're going to see all of it anyway. I've done a lot of work for you today as well. Deep diving a lot of things. And I will bring that to you. Okay. We're going to get a full summary on exactly what the hell <laughs> Attorney John Ray said there. And you're also going to get a full presentation on these unsolved Bardstown murders, which is also very interesting. That's connected to potentially it's a discussion based on Crystal Rogers case and her dad, Tommy Ballard and the Hauk brothers and that deep dive that we've been doing. So there is a playlist there for you for that as well. Okay. So just hold on one second. All right. Yeah. Great. Dane mom says your plate just got really full. It's always really full. <laughs> it always is. Yes. And we're going to have to, uh, 
do a deep dive again on Caitlin Armstrong's case just to refresh ourselves because her trial's coming up on October 30th. And then tomorrow, Richard Allen, Delphi, is in court and Judge Gull is allowing cameras in the courtroom, but it's going to be a, a media pool. It's not going to be live streamed. They are going to film it. So it's kind of like Koberger. They're going to be filming it. And then afterwards, they'll be broadcasting it. So we have to do that as well. That is a huge deal. What's happening there in Delphi is a massive deal. Are the defense attorneys going to be dismissed or not? Yeah. So don't worry. There's always 10 things going on in the background. <laughs> Never worry if you don't see me. I'm always working on something for you. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Let's all go watch it again. Let's do that. Okay. Let's watch it again. Make your own notes. Know that I'm going to be preparing a presentation for you. And I'll see you again very soon. Make sure you subscribe if you're not yet. Welcome to all the new subscribers. Thank you, Mods, for everything you do. Mods, I'll uh, update you in a moment after this. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Okay. Bye, everyone.